because we record these and we put them up on uh, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. So again, this is Chris Perry uh, with Castle Wealth Group, and we're going to do our weekly Wednesday webinar. Uh, it's all about kind of uh, answering questions that people submit specifically for this or any common questions that really pop up throughout the week. Uh, and uh, I have four questions right off the bat uh, that I have from people. And good to see you, Joe. Thanks, Bev. Thanks, Therese. Um, and if you do have any questions, feel free to submit those in the question and answer section. But let me share my screen and we'll get into looks like what I want to share. All right. So, uh, and again, if you want to see how any of this information applies to you, uh, if you have questions on anything, feel free to just go ahead and set up a phone call with me uh, and we can kind of problem solve or troubleshoot what we need to do. Uh, read this for cash count. Cash count. Uh, and Therese, maybe give me a little more on that question, but I let me kind of gather this in with the rest of them. Cash count with no interest. interest. Um, okay, so the first issue is uh, refinancing. And, and so this is kind of interesting because of uh, the lowering of interest rates. So I've had a lot of clients uh, attempting to refinance. And, there, and there's some issues that go along with refinancing uh, because the interest rates are, are pretty darn low right now. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, the positive of low interest rates uh, is that you can get a, a low rate on your mortgage. So right now I see clients getting less than 3% uh, uh, for a mortgage, which uh, anything below four, I've always said is a good idea. And then some people are in the, do we pay off the house first or do we uh, have a mortgage at a really, really low interest rate? And there's pros and cons to both. The advantage of the uh, having, carrying a mortgage at a low interest rate is let's say that your mortgage rate is two and a half percent. If we can earn 4% somewhere else, uh, then you're just using arbitrage. And on top of that, you're getting what's called a compounding interest, where you're the one that's gaining on that interest versus the bank is gaining on the interest. So from a numbers perspective, a lot of times, if you can uh, handle that low interest rate mortgage, from a financial standpoint, it makes sense to maintain that mortgage. If on the other hand, uh, we look at it from a psychology standpoint, a lot of times they have this dream of moving into retirement and having the home paid off. And that, that just feels good to be quote unquote debt free. Uh, and there's no right or wrong answer. My background was actually in uh, finance uh, as well as psychology and undergrad. So I understand both, and both are, are valid. Um, but as people are moving towards these refinancing uh, issues, uh, we're running into questions with regards to how does this affect uh, whether I have a trust or uh, a ladybird deed. So how is that real estate owned or how is the real estate titled? And really, typically what we see is either it's what's called a ladybird deed because we don't want a home just in your name. If a home is in your name and you pass away, it ends up going into probate. And we know that we want to try to avoid that. So really, when we're planning for the home from a, a legacy or estate planning perspective, we're focusing, we're doing what's called a ladybird deed where it's in your name while you're alive and then upon death, it avoids probate and goes to whoever's listed on the deed. It's kind of like a beneficiary designation for your home. Or we might have the trust as the owner of the deed. Uh, and so typically uh, this would be if we're doing like a castle trust, like an asset protection trust. So uh, because the advantage of that is you can sell it inside of the trust and the home's protected from Medicaid and, and that type of thing. So that's why sometimes we have the trust as the owner. So when you go about refinancing, it's really between you and a mortgage company. And each mortgage company can create their own rules and of how they want to handle things. So, uh, and we've had a lot of different uh, mortgage companies that we've been working with with clients. And so let me give you the legal answer and then we'll talk about kind of the real world answer. So if you are thinking about refinancing, and if it's a ladybird deed, which says it's in your name while you're alive, uh, then you can do whatever you want. In fact, the deed will say you can uh, mortgage it, refinance it, sell it, et cetera. You have complete control. But some uh, refinance companies 
of saying won't accept a, a ladybird deed. And we've had to go back and forth. And from a legal standpoint, the home is in your name, so you can do whatever you want. You can refinance it. So it shouldn't be a problem. But that said, these mortgage companies are private institutions and they can kind of create their own uh, rules. Uh, so if you're having troubles at one company, you could always look to another company because uh, depending on who you talk to that day at the same company, you might get different answers on some of these things, which, which can be really frustrating. But from a legal standpoint, if you are doing a ladybird deed, you should have absolutely zero problems with a refinance. Now, if the trust, if it's a trust owned property, uh, so typically we're doing an asset protection trust, a castle trust. Uh, the way that we draft the trust, legally, you still should have no problem because it's a grantor trust. And there's this act that I can't remember, I can't spell it off the top of my head, but it's the Graham Beach Act of, I think, 1993 that says that um, a mortgage company cannot basically discriminate or, or trigger a due on sale clause on any type of grantor trust, meaning for... Um, if you have a grantor trust, you still should be able to refinance. You still should. Uh, they can't trigger any the mortgage because it's not technically in your name, even though it's like in a piggy bank that you're holding on to. So from a legal perspective, they shouldn't give you any problems on the refinance as well. Um, but for whatever reason, some refinance companies want you to deed the property out of the trust, do the refinance there, and then deed it back. Um, while there's other uh, mortgage companies that will do the refinance directly in the trust. So just understand from a legal perspective, whether you have it as a ladybird deed or the trust owned, you should not have any issues with a refinance, but it might be based on that uh, business. Uh, they can have their own rules or procedures, but there are companies that refinance for sure. If it's a ladybird deed without having to uh, undo, do another deed in the meantime, uh, same with a trust owned. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, with the refinancing and the site and, and continuing on that thought with the low interest rates and why everyone's doing these uh, refinances. Um, that's good. Uh, that, that keeps the mortgage rates low. Uh, the other, but the, the flip side of the coin and the downside of having this low interest rate is that it's really affected the bond market. So, and I've, I've talked about this before, but there's this idea that as we move into retirement, uh, maybe we change the amount of equities and bonds, and now we go more heavily bond-sided. Uh, but unfortunately, with interest rates dropping, bonds and, and CDs are also underperforming. So if you are looking for safety, you might not want to always just focus on bonds or, or especially CDs, which aren't offering a very good rate of return. Uh, so that is the refinance. Um, uh, Therese... No question. Um, I'll have to get to that. Uh, trust administration. Uh, unfortunately, we've had we've had this for a while, but um, when you set up estate plans and trusts, at some point, you're going to have to administer them. Someone's passed away, and, and now we need to walk through the steps. And this is something that we will help you with for sure, but really, at its base, this is getting into a state administration. So, when someone passes away, how do assets transfer out of their name? Uh, and first would be through joint ownership. So if you're a joint on an account, it goes to whoever the beneficiary is. Uh, second would be, or the, whoever you're a joint with. Second would be beneficiary designations. So if you have an IRA or 401k, it's going to whoever you named as a beneficiary. Uh, third would be through a trust. So that's what we're going to talk about. But if an asset doesn't pass through joint ownership, beneficiary designation or trust, then it ends up going into probate. And that's what we want to try to avoid. So typically we're relying on one of these first three ways. Uh, and so let's focus on the trust. What are the steps to administer a trust, just big picture? Uh, and we've had whole webinars on estate administration. Uh, but when you're administering the trust, the most important thing is the death certificates. And you're going to get these, or actually the funeral home typically will get these, uh, for you, but usually it takes about 14 uh, days, sometimes a week before you get the death certificates. But unfortunately, there's really nothing you can do until you get the death certificates. Um, that is unless you have set up uh, final expenses, uh, which more and more people are doing. So uh, when someone passes away uh, with a, a final expense product, you could have the payout within 24 uh, to 48 hours to handle paying for the funeral and expenses and that type of thing. Um, 
And then the death certificate, typically this will take maybe 10 days. And the death certificate is what you're going to utilize as you're transferring money from the trust to whoever the beneficiaries are. Uh, you're gonna need a death certificate. That's gonna be through the funeral home. And then you're going to most likely need a certificate of trust showing who the trust, the new acting trustee is. So if it's a revocable living trust or a trust you created while you're alive, and then you pass away, chances are there's going to be another trustee, someone you appointed already, that needs to step up and start acting. And so for them to be able to act with the financial institutions, they're going to have to get a death certificate from the funeral home and then a certificate of trust, which is something that we can prepare. And then from there, uh, then it's making just gathering the assets, going through the um, joint ownership beneficiary designation trust, make sure we get a full list of the assets, uh, paying off expenses, make sure there's no bills hanging out there. Typically we recommend about a month before you start thinking about dispersing, at least a month bef before you start distributing assets uh, because you you'll see what bills are coming in, that type of thing. Uh, and then uh, one thing I did forget, so certificate of trust. Also something we can help you with is quite often when we might need to get a new trust ID because a trust is an idea, ID of a, um, typically the individual who set up the trust. Uh, it's in their social security number. So we might have to get a new trust ID from the IRS website, which isn't super complicated, but something that we can help you with. Uh, and then uh, uh, distribute the funds. So distribute the assets. So once we're sure all the bills are paid off, then we follow the terms of the trust and we distribute the assets and they might go out right to them or maybe it's held in a separate trust uh, where now whatever they're inheriting from you is protected. Um, but that's kind of the trust administration process. Uh, ideally, this is done within a year just so that you don't run into any tax issues because if a, a trust stays open for over a year, then you might have to do a trust tax return. Uh, but ideally, all of this is handled within a year. Um, okay. Then the next question uh, or issue is really around Medicare. And so this is typically for people 65 and older. Uh, and I just want to do a brief little overview because what's important is it's uh, coming up on open enrollment period. Uh, where from October 15th to December 7th, uh, you can kind of switch around which Medicare plans you're in. Uh, and um, a lot of times this is a time to kind of price check to make sure there isn't anything better out there because uh, things change quite often. But just a big overview of Medicare, uh, we call this the alphabet soup. You're gonna have part A uh, and B. Part A and B is what's called original Medicare. And then typically with that, you're going to add a supplemental policy uh, as well as part D, which covers uh, insur um, prescription costs. Uh, the other option is you can go with part C, uh, which is called the Advantage Plan. Uh, and basically the Advantage Plan would replace the original Medicare as well as the supplement. I would say a majority of people that we work with choose um, Medicare Part A and B uh, with uh, basically the original with a supplement plan. Uh, and that's something that with our, our team and uh, it's something that we can help you with now. So uh, if you are over 65 and on Medicare and want us to take a look at things, uh, we can certainly do that. Then uh, this question which was submitted, determining the best investment tool, what is the best way to determine how it will affect my taxes? Uh, this was just emailed in uh, a day ago. Old school says in deferred accounts until retirement, but I know some seniors that did such and they're paying more in taxes. Uh, I can't, I hear this so often. Uh, and it's kind of the old paradigm versus the new paradigm. The old paradigm was all about deferred, deferred, deferred paying taxes uh, as long as possible. But now moving into 2020, a lot of people are thinking that taxes are gonna go up in the future uh, because that's what the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act says. That's, if you look at the amount of debt we have as a country, uh, we had coming into 2020, we had $23 trillion worth of debt. With the CARES Act, we had another $2.2 trillion. And then we're supposed to have another round of the CARES Act. 
So a lot of experts are thinking that we're not going to come out of this year with less than $30 trillion worth of debt. And so that has to be paid off at some point. What are, what are the choices? Are they going to cut spending? Probably not. Uh, so they're going to potentially raise taxes. In fact, I, I saw an article uh, uh, talking about Europe and how a country over there, because of all the debt they have, they're raising taxes. So uh, I, I think people need to kind of rethink this. And this brings up what I think the, the biggest risks right now for retirees. And the first one is tax risk, where if you're looking, sitting there with IRA money or 401k money or 403b money, pre-tax dollars, um, understand if taxes go up, the value of those accounts go down. And just like we we're talking about in terms of home ownership, a lot of people like to be like debt free in retirement. Well, guess what? If you own IRA money, if you own 401k money pre tax, you're not debt free. You have a debt you have to pay to the federal government. Uh, and it's just a matter of when and how you pay it. And if we know that, so think of it kind of like a mortgage, right? You, you own a home and it sells for 500000 but you have a $100,000 mortgage. How much do you really have? 400,000, right? Similar with your IRAs. If you have 500,000 sitting in your IRA, do you really have 500,000? No, you have to pay tax. Maybe it's 22% or 24%. Well, guess what? Not only is it a mortgage, it's an adjustable rate mortgage based on where marginal in income tax brackets are when you withdraw from those accounts. So if we know that taxes are going up in the future, then having a tax plan, and this is something that we can help you with, uh, in fact, I, I was sitting with someone just before this meeting is where we're uh, talking about where they're at and looking at their tax brackets and how much they could pull out of that money, uh, maybe do a Roth conversion um, before they jump into the next higher tax bracket. Because right now, taxes are going up with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, where right now, if you're at the 22% tax bracket, guess what? In 2025, if not before, that might be the 25% tax bracket. Uh, and the reason I say, if not before, is we have the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that runs to 2025. But if we have a change in presidency, uh, we might not get the full five years of that Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So taxes could uh, revert back to their pre-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, amount sooner than 2025. So really, it's a two-step process uh, when we talk about tax planning. And the first thing is, so step one is figure out how much, okay? How much to pull out of those pre-tax accounts in any given year. And what we've been doing is working on, uh, and we're really right in the middle of this right now with our clients, just based on getting near the end of the year, is looking at those tax returns, figuring out how much we can pull before we move up to the next tax bracket. And then the second question, and this really depends just on what are your goals, uh, what do you have in terms of current investments? What legal structures do you have in place? Second question is what to do with it. So let's say we do pull $100,000 out of the IRA, pay the tax, where do we put it? Does it go into a Roth? Does it go into the trust? Do we want it in the market? Do we want it in annuities? Do we want it sitting in CDs? Do we want it sitting in checking savings? That's gonna be a more in-depth conversation, more individualized. Um, but the first question is how much to convert and the second is what to do with it. And also understand that whatever you're investing inside of your IRA, whether it's mutual funds, stocks, bonds, equities, you can pay the tax and invest in that same exact thing somewhere else. Um, so this is important, not only for those that have accumulated wealth, which is a lot of retirees, they're sitting on larger IRAs, but also think about it in terms of if you're still working, where are you saving money? Are you saving money into tax deferred accounts that are going to grow tax free or tax deferred where when you pull that money out, if we are at higher tax time, uh, you're going to receive less of a benefit. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful. All right, let's see. If I'm uh, that's as with trust in place, we have the death certificate and trust ID. There's assets in the middle, there's large chance trust will have no income when prepping for that's kind of just me account provide what actually is needed to designate. Um, okay, so there's a, a question submitted my question to speak cash account with no interest. And my question falls under trust. And dad's assets were limited in his life. So this is getting back up to trust administration. So when someone passes away, uh, we have to pay off any of the final expenses, et cetera. 
dad's assets were limited as life insurance and cash with no interest. So what you would do is open up an account, make sure those accounts are in the trust. The trust will have no income. Um, so with that, if the trust has no income, then you don't have to worry about paying any trust taxes. Frank for vendor money was put into the designated account to provide dad's needs actually. Um, are we preparing a final account? Yeah, this might be, let's, uh, why don't you just schedule a time uh, by going to that website and we can kind of dig into it a little bit more. Uh, the question was getting into details of a specific trust administration um, uh, situation. So uh, yeah, why don't we, that'd be better off for just a phone call. Let's, let's talk about it real quick. Um, okay, so, uh, and that is, everything I have in terms of the submitted questions. Thank you, you're welcome. Um, so if you do have any last questions, please uh, send in via the Q&A the last question. I'll take a look at it and clear out the ones that I answered. Um, okay, so with that, I wanna thank everyone for taking time to listen to me blabber on about death taxes. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, this is actually the largest uh, number of people we've had. Good to see Elaine and Joe and Mary and Mary and Pete and Phil and RJ and Tim and, and all the other people that I did mention. Um, I really do appreciate these. Uh, I've gotten a lot of good feedback uh, and uh, we're going to continue doing these because we used to do uh, weekly workshops, basically weekly workshops, educational workshops really believe in education and, and we, we miss some of that connection, but this is our, our best option uh, in the virtual world. So with that, thank you everyone. Uh, same time next week, same login. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to email those over, uh, contact at uh, Castle Wealth Group, uh, email them over. Uh, you're welcome, Phil, thank you so much. All right, take care, bye-bye.